It's a great pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Marco Quintana. He's a boy. <laughs> At least we didn't we didn't lose the mic. So um, I got to know Marco when when I very first went down to uh, meet with Jacob and and David Lister in uh, Marco's hometown. And I thought on the Sunday, uh, David just told me, he says, well, we're out of here, but Marco will take care of you. And I thought, oh, how's this going to work out? But you know, we just hung out, and we hung out with his family. And um, I, I count you as a very good friend and a very dear brother and someone well worth listening to. All right. Well... Welcome again. You, you heard Jacob last night and you heard John last night and you still came back. So that's a good sign. Praise the Lord. So let's come before the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, your son, we thank you for all your goodness and blessings and your care, Lord God, your loving kindness to us and your mercies, Lord, are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, Lord. Apart from your mercy, Lord, we will be consumed. So we thank you this morning for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, for your word that you've given him to us, Lord. Thank you for the man who gave us this translation, Lord God. Thank you for the man who risked their lives and gave up their lives, Lord God, so we can have it in English, so we can read it and apply it in our lives. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for those who taught us the word from very young age to now. We thank you, Lord, for those who watch over our souls as the elders and leaders of churches and ministries. We praise you, Lord God, for your kindness upon them. And we ask you, Lord, to open our hearts today to your word, to the glory, to the meaning, to draw us near to your son, Lord, to make us more like him and help us to apply this through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we start, I have a couple of things that we want to uh, just let you know a little bit about our ministry. If we have that, there it is. Uh, Maybe this is not a good angle to be at. Maybe I should be on the right side, but you could kind of see a little bit. CCODtruth.org is our website. That's our church, Devor Truth. We're in San Bernardino. If there's anything we can do for you, email us. Let us know. There, we've got um, lots of teachings on YouTube uh, from Brother Jacob to John to other speakers. They're on that YouTube page as well. So you can avail yourself of those wonderful materials that the Lord has given us, plus other teachings from our elders and uh, some of our guest speakers that come from a local area. They're all in our YouTube page. And if you have questions, uh, you can email us. You can sign up for like a newsletter that we can send out electronically uh, to you just to keep up with what we're doing. I also help Jacob with Memorial Ministries, and we go on missions and we go trips like this to uh, encourage the body of Christ throughout the world. And so I'm so glad to be in Canada once again. My wife's family actually came from the UK to Ottawa. Her family were from originally from the UK, then to Ottawa, then they came to Southern California. So she spent some time up here in Vancouver when she was single before she married me, going up to Mount Whistler and snowboarding and, and things that I could never do. She's a lot more, um, I guess, physically gifted in that capacity than me. Uh, so we have some history in the Canadian area. At the same time, my kids are both Hispanic and uh, English Canadians, I guess. I don't know exactly what that makes them, but the, uh, they love Jesus, so that makes them believers. So that's a good thing. Uh, at the same time, uh, a little bit about our ministry myself. I was actually born, not born in America. I was actually born in Nicaragua, which is a small little country in Central America, if you've known about it. I lived in, under communist rule for quite some time until the Lord took us out of there and we came to the state. So I um, have a little bit of background in what to live in a communist socialist country, which I see our own country today, the United States, heading into that direction. So I know quite well where this is going, and I, I've tried to warn people about what our family went through and why I experienced myself. Uh, but the Lord saved us. The Lord brought us out from darkness to light. I was raised Roman Catholic, and the Lord really showed us through in our family uh, who the real Jesus was and what it means to be born again. And through God's grace, through my sisters and my mom came to the Lord. And so uh, we're so thankful that um, Jesus has done that work in our lives. So we know a little bit about uh, being in false religious systems. We know a little bit about what it's like to be uh, in agnosticism. That's what mostly I described myself when I was in college and university. So I was not raised in a Christian home. So I don't come to anybody with this idea that I was raised in a Christian home or a Christian background. I was actually anti-Bible, anti-Christian, argue with Christians all the time about what the Bible was and the, uh, the integrity of it. 
only to become a pastor. God has a very, very good sense of humor. Now I find myself debating against agnostics and uh, agnosticism and, and Gnosticism, which is prevalent in the church today. So we are simply wanting to teach God's word and get, let people know what the word of God is and to fall in love with the Bible and to know what the Bible is about uh, more than just teaching about the Bible. We want people to know what the Bible is about. And it's about Jesus, and it's about the Holy Spirit in your life and my life, making it real to each one of us. Today, we've been talking about, or today's first, first, first session, but the last night, we were talking about this idea of church for the churchless. And I want to take a look at something very important. And I think it's in, uh, very much for today and for our meetings today. And I asked the Lord, I said, what do you want us to share? What, what, what can I share? What can I contribute to the body of Christ? And the Lord said, go to the book of Revelation. So we're going to go there. Book of Revelation, chapter 3, please. The Church of Philadelphia, the sixth church. The book of Revelation, the sixth church. Most people oftentimes, when I asked them, what, was the, what were the last words of Jesus? They usually talk about the cross. They usually talk about the last seven words on the cross or, or his great commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. Uh, oftentimes they forget that there are other letters that Jesus wrote after those events, and they're found in the book of Revelation. Seven letters to seven churches. The book of Revelation describes the seven letters to seven churches, and the sixth one is, of course, probably one of the most famous ones, is the book of Revelation says, Philadelphia is the sixth church. Let's read verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have little power, little strength, and you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come to you, uh, come and bow down at your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that which I was, that hour is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have. And this is the critical part because this is the title of our message today. In order that no one takes away your crown. He who, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Very quickly, the Church of Philadelphia, the faithful church, we all like to be like that. It's in the middle of two other churches, Sardis and Laodicea, the fifth and the seventh. Sardis, not so many good things to say. A few good things. You have some good things, Jesus said, mostly bad. Laodicea, nothing good, everything bad. Philadelphia, nothing bad, everything good. But there were very little, very little in strength, very little in numbers, very little in influence. There were a remnant, as you would say, in the middle of two giant influential churches, Sardis, Laodicea, it was right in the middle of it. It was probably the most, uh, the smallest of all the cities that Jesus talked about in this, uh, in his letter, in his letters. The smallest one and the youngest one. It's actually quite interesting. There's um, not a whole lot of excavation in Philadelphia today, but there are some remaining things that you could see. This city, the city called Al Sahir, Al Sahir is built on top of Philadelphia today. If you go there, and there's a couple of things you could see. There's a couple of pillars, which is kind of interesting. What you have as pillars. Uh, it was a key city. It was a key city at the time of the Roman Empire. At the time of the Roman Empire, it was a very key city. It was sort of a, the gateway, they call it, the gateway to the east. It was influential in this way. It was used as a way to get Hellenism into the east. It was a way to get Hellenism into the east, and this city was very well used by the Roman Empire, and it was literally called the door to the east, a gateway to the east, and the environment was kind of interesting because it was a volcanic area with lots of volcanoes, fertile soil. They had lots of grapes, lots of vineyards. Of course, they worshiped the god uh, Dionysius, which is the god of wine. And uh, the temples, very, very prevalent. It was called the Little Athens because of the many temples that they had. It was also a place where the name kept changing quite a bit. 
It was first Philadelphia, brotherly love, city of brotherly love, named after the king who had a good brother. And because the, they got along so well and they had such love for each other, they said, this is Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, brothers who love each other. But then it changed to Neo Caesarea. It was a name given because of Tiberius helped them build, rebuild the city after massive earthquakes. And there's a lot of volcanoes, a lot of volcanic activity. You can kind of see where the city had to keep being rebuilt. And so they were very used to rebuilding and buildings and, and things like that. And you can see why Jesus used some of those uh, terms about key, about a building, about pillars, about temples, right? They were used to that kind of, that was the mindset of the time that they had. It was also changed at the, uh, later on, it was also changed to Flavia, which is named after um, the Roman general who became an emperor, and it was named after his family, Vespasian. Vespasian and his family last name was Flavia, so they changed the name to that, to the city, again, to that name. The name kept changing, but Jesus makes a promise that he's going to give them a better name, a much, much better name than what they were used to. All that to say, Jesus was very much in line to what they knew, what they thought about, how they viewed life and their worldview at the time that this was written. It's sort of like if Jesus were to write about Vancouver and he will talk about an island. You will know what, oh, there's an island here. Or maybe he would mention, uh, you know, the Strait of George or something like that, or seafood. It would have been well known to the people of the area, just like here, that these are kind of things that you think about. This is how you view life. This is the, there's a shore, there's ocean, there's a specific ocean. So at the time, Jesus is writing to them for that very, very perspective. Jesus knew where they lived. Jesus knew what they were up against. But the church itself was a struggling church. Oh, I can't see the thing. That's why it's like I'm, I'm falling a little bit behind. But here's the gateway to the east. From the east into Turkey, the area uh, of, of Phrygia, Getting into that area was a key, key city to open up to Hellenism. But let's continue. The church itself, out of the seven churches, this one and Smyrna, nothing bad is said about him. Nothing bad is said about him, but it's quite interesting. The description that Jesus gives of himself is the longest of any letter. The description of Jesus is the longest. And just re read again, verse 7, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, he who is holy, he who is true, who has the key of David. This is quite an amazing description because the book of Revelation, apart from any other book, describes Jesus with terms that were for Yahweh in the Old Testament. These two of them are right here. Yahweh is called holy. Yahweh is called true in the Old Testament. And by the way, the, the, it comes from the book of Isaiah. And I want to make sure that I, I mark the right one. There he is. He who is holy. The book of Isaiah says, God is holy. We read yesterday. What well, we almost got, Jacob's going to get to that today. Isaiah chapter 6, holy, holy, we did read it yesterday. Holy, 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 God Almighty. You know, Isaiah looks in the temple and he sees God and he says, woe is me. Holy, the number one term for God, the description of God in the whole Bible, the number one, it's not love, it's holiness, holiness. God is a God of holiness. God is a God of righteousness. Those terms are much more used than uh, what we would consider today in our 21st century, you know, a God of love, a God of mercy. The Bible says in 1 John, God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. Later on in the book of 1 John, we're introduced to the fact that God is love. But we need to know that God is light and holy before we, need to, before we understand that God is love. Why is that important? Because unless you understand the holiness of God, you wouldn't understand his love, the mercy and kindness that comes through Jesus and the fact that, woe is me, we're all undone because God is holy. And yet that is his term that God introduces himself to the church of Philadelphia. Jesus says, I am holy. In the book of Isaiah, we're going to get there today because I want to make the comparison of a faithful man in the Old Testament. And it was in uh, the life of Hezekiah. And the, uh, the church of Philadelphia mirrors the life of Hezekiah. It's an illustration of what faithfulness ought to be, especially a man who was a king, son of David, who was challenged was always being challenged from within and from without regarding his crown, regarding his kingdom, regarding his position. And so we're going to see that today because that same promise is made to, or the same warning is made to the Church of Philadelphia. Let no one take your crown. Well, that is very much epitomized in the life of Hezekiah, who was always had this fighting thing against him, whether they were the Assyrians, whether from within, there was this constant challenge to his throne don't, don't let anyone take away your crown. We're going to see how that applies to our lives today. 
But in Isaiah, in chapter 37, we're, we see this amazing picture of the God hears the prayers of Isaiah, of Hezekiah, and through Isaiah, he says, I've heard Sennacherib, I heard Rabshakeh, those insolent men, those blasphemers, and they say that I am like other gods, that they're going to take over Jerusalem because they have conquered all the other cities and all the other gods didn't stand before him. He's got news. God's got news for him. They're not going to do it because I am holy, God says. I am holy. I'm not like the other gods. And that was well known to the people of, of Israel, especially in Jerusalem, who were being challenged, who were being attacked by the Assyrian. And it also says, Jesus says, he's the true one. And I like to use the word reality because sometimes we get confused with truth in the sense of in a relativistic society in which we live in. We don't really know what truth is. The word for truth in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, you can translate it very easily as reality. Reality, right? It's the reality. Jesus is reality. What is the reality of your life? It's not where you live. It's not what you do. It's not you know, things you have accomplished, the reality of your life and who you are, it's based in Jesus. Our identity is in the real one. He is the true one. He is the real one. All other gods are false, the Bible says. All other gods are false. All isms are false. All isms are false. The only isms I like is evangelism and baptism. So you can take that. And those are the only isms I ever follow. If you follow anything else, it won't work. But Jesus is the true one. And the Bible says that in this particular passage, Jesus says, I am the one who is true, who is holy, who has the key of David. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because i got so many notes and I have to just basically get all this out in about an hour because i got one session and that's it. So thank God you only get me for one session and that's it. But i got to get it all in. In the book of Isaiah again, during the reign of Hezekiah, Isaiah 22, we're introduced to two men. Two men that were the chief of staff of Hezekiah. One was named Shibna and the other one was named Eliakim. And Shibna was not a good guy, but he was the one who had the commission to the household of the king. He was second in command, basically. And the Bible says that when he was in command of that, he wasn't doing a good job. And actually, he was heaping for himself treasures and he wanted to one up the king and he had made this incredible tomb for his death for his tribute he had built chariots he had all this set aside for himself and God says I know about Shibna I know what he's doing and he's not doing what he's called to do because he was the one who had the key to the household and the treasures of David because Hezekiah was a son of David king of Judah and Shibna was not doing a good job in fact, it was all about himself, and he wanted to one-up the king, and God says, no, I'm going to throw you out of the kingdom like a ball, literally like a ball rolling out of this kingdom, and you're going to die in another country. But it says, but take a look at Eliakim, Eliakim. Eliakim is the man that God says, he is the faithful one. He is the faithful steward, and he will be given that key, the key to the household of David, and he will open, and no one will shut, and he will shut, and no one opens. I don't think any one of us reading that passage in Isaiah would have ever thought of Jesus in those terms, but he does. He says, look at that passage in the Old Testament. This is me. I am the faithful one. I am the true one. I am the humble one. Because Eliakim was a very humble man, and God says, that's the man that is going to hold the key. He will open for the king and he will shut. He will be the second in command like Joseph. He will be the one that determined, goes into the kingdom and who comes out of the kingdom. And this is Jesus, my friend. Jesus is the only one that can bring us into the kingdom, but he's the only one also that can throw us out of the kingdom, which is kind of an interesting thing because in, in later on, we'll just read it with me. I know your deeds. I have before you an open door which no one can shut because you have little power. And we'll read that about Hezekiah. And have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they're Jews and are not, but lie. Jewish believers were being thrown out of the synagogues at this time. The Jewish believers, those who trusted in Jesus, were not being welcomed in the synagogue. It got worse as, as the persecution increased. But Jesus says, I'm the one who can throw anybody out. And I'm the one who lets people in. It's not them. It's not the synagogue of Satan. He had no problem calling it a synagogue of Satan, by the way. And Eliakim had this authority, but this authority is pictured in Jesus. And it was encouragement to all believers. And the encouragement was this. Jesus says, I know you have done a few things. I'm behind a little bit. Here we go. 
You have kept my word. You have kept my word. Oh, you little flock. You small church of Philadelphia, the one that nobody cares about, the one that is non-influential, that nobody even knows is around. Everybody wants to go to Sardis. Everybody wants to go to Laodicea. But you have kept my word. You're the one that obeys it, says the Lord. Secondly, you have courage. It says that you have not denied my name. In the midst of difficulties and persecution and hardships, you confess Christ and you maintain Christ and you are faithful. And that's what the word faith means. Faith in Jesus means to be faithful to Jesus. Many times people say, I have faith, I believe. And many times what people mean that is they have, they believe that. They believe that Jesus is who he is. They believe that. But the Bible says have faith in Jesus. And it's quite a different thing. Believing that Jesus is X, Y, Z doesn't make you a Christian. Believing in Jesus makes you a Christian. Believing that does not make you a Christian. Believing in, it's the only way to be a Christian. But what's the difference? I can give you a sheet today with our statement of faith, and if you check off all the boxes, it doesn't mean you're a Christian. It just means you agree. But when you have faith in Jesus, it's quite a different story. It's not that you believe that. It's that you believe in. You trust him. And trust is displayed in obedience. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. Remember they teach you that song when you first became a Christian? It's a wonderful song. Trust and obey. There is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Very true. Very theologically sound songs. Why? Because Jesus says, have faith in me. Not faith that I, faith in him. And that's what Jesus is saying. You remain faithful. And it says, you endure patiently. Look at verse 10. You endure patiently. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, they were not fair-weather Christians. They weren't in because the sun was out and it was nice and cozy and it was just a beautiful day and everybody feels like a Christian on Sunday, but they were Christians on Monday. Hello? Christians on Monday? You know that difficult day where it seems like the devil attacks us even more? Well, you don't remember what was said on Sunday if you went to church or didn't go to church and what did the pastor say and I'm so discouraged because my boss feels like I'm the, he's the antichrist and he's attacking me or my job is like this and you don't know which way out and I said what verse should I read and and all these things happen on Monday I know been there for 17 years in the corporate world I know exactly what that is and Monday seems to be is the devil's day but Jesus says you endured patiently you weren't fair weather. No matter what the environment, you didn't give up. You continue to live for me. And that's what faithfulness, and that's what faith is. It's the same word. Faith, faithfulness, you keep going. It's easy to leave the faith when it's hard. It's easy to leave the faith when it's hard. But Jesus says, you endured my perseverance. We live in an age where it's called existentialism. People live for today only. That's it. It's only what happens today or the near future. The Bible says we need to live with an eschatological thinking. I am living in today, as it is today, because I have no other day. I'm not promised tomorrow. I can't go back to yesterday, but I can live today. But I'm living for the next one. I'm living for tomorrow. I'm living for the kingdom to come. I'm in the kingdom by God's grace through the Holy Spirit and in the regeneration. Absolutely, we are in the kingdom of God, but the kingdom is not yet. It's now, but not yet. It is coming. It is something future. And Christians live for that day. We're the people of tomorrow, as you would say. But people want to have it today. If the Lord doesn't answer a prayer by next Tuesday, we're out of here, right? Nobody, you know, the Lord doesn't answer tomorrow. We're not staying in the faith. But the Bible says you're to stay and persevere. And that's the critical part for Christians, to stay and persevere. He who endures till the end will be saved. All these wonderful scriptures come to mind when Jesus begins to tell us what it means to be a Christian. It means to continue. We have a foretaste of what's to come through the Holy Spirit. We have a foretaste of what the kingdom is going to be like, but it's for tomorrow. Wait patiently for the Lord, said James. Look at the farmer. He plants, but he's patient. He, the crop's not going to come tomorrow, but the crop is coming. And that's what Christians have to be. And Jesus says, I would rather have a small church that is faithful, obedient, enduring, persevering, instead of a big church like Sardis and Laodicea who have abandoned my word and have not kept the faith. That's what Jesus says to this church, and I'm sure it was an encouragement to them that were little 
It says they had little strength. They had little influence. They're very small. In fact, nobody wanted to go to Philadelphia. Everybody wants to go to Sardis. Look at the big church. They've got smoke machines and big lights and the big band. And look at Laodicea. Oh, everybody goes there. The, you know, Justin Bieber goes there. Um, people go there, right? The names, the who's who of this world, they go to those places. But Jesus says, I'd rather have this one. I'd rather have this one. Look at his advice. I'm coming quickly, says the Lord. Hold fast to what you have in order that no one takes your crown. Don't let anyone, not the devil, not the false church, not false believers, not the fallen away, take away what Jesus wants to give us. This is the word of Stephanos, the reward. This is what Jesus has for His reward is with Him. It's a reward from the Lord. Those who run the race, those who persevere, those who stay with it, don't give up. In Romans 15 and 1 Corinthians 10, it tells us, and Jacob quoted from them yesterday, that everything in the Old Testament was not written, was written not to us. It was not written to us, but it was written for us. It's quite of a different thing. It was written to the Jewish people at their time. It was written to them, but it was written for us. So we, through the word, will have encouragement. We will have, we will be, learn how to have patience. We will learn what not to do. What the Jewish people fell into, what the children of Israel fell into, but it was written for us so that we can learn, that we can know that the same God whom you prayed today, the same God that you bow the knee today, said, Jesus, help me, was there with them in the wilderness, spoke to Abraham, was there at Isaac's, uh, the, 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 the sacrifice that almost happened with Isaac. He was there with David facing Goliath. He was there with Jacob wrestling in the brook of Job, and he was there. It's the same God, the same God, the same Jesus you called on today. He was the one there. And he's saying to us today, it was written for them, but look how I behave. Because God doesn't change. Same faithfulness, same power, same spirit, same strength, same encouragement. I will give you if you do what I say. If you do what I say, that same power, the same God that worked within the life of the Jewish people will be in your life. So I want to turn real quickly right now to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah chapter 36, please. This is exemplified, or the best way to describe it, it's in the book, in the life of Hezekiah. In the life of Hezekiah. In the life of Hezekiah, he is a man. And by the way, you can find the life of Hezekiah. We're only going to read in a few spots because I don't have a lot of time. If we had another session, we could do that. But Isaiah, 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles. Three times, we have a lot of details about the life of Hezekiah. When the Bible gives us multiple accounts like that, it is ultra important. Just like the Gospels, we have four accounts of Jesus' life. Just like Paul's conversion, we have multiple accounts of Paul's conversion in Acts, and the uh, it, three times in Acts and multiple times in the epistles. We have the same account of Hezekiah, his rule and reign, multiple times, Second Kings, Second Chronicles, and the book of Isaiah. And in chapter 36, it came about in the 14th year of Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against the fortified cities of Judah to grab a hold of them, to seize them. What we know about Hezekiah up to this point, if you read 2 Kings, is he was a good king. He was a faithful king, but he was a son of an unfaithful king. He was a son of an unfaithful king named Ahaz. Ahaz did horrible things, terrible things before the eyes of the Lord. He built up temples. He did not fortify the city. He did everything that was evil in the sight of the Lord. And then comes Hezekiah, comes on the throne, comes on the scene, and he's immediately challenged. He's challenged by a few things. The enemies outside, the Assyrians. But I said earlier about Shebna, there were enemies within that were challenging his throne, that were challenging his crown, that were challenging to rule as king of Israel, a king of Judah, I should say, as the son of David. There was somebody that was always trying to take away his crown. Remember the church of Philadelphia? Let no one take away your crown. Hezekiah faced the same challenges you and I face. Why? The devil was trying to take away his crown. Said the Assyrians were coming. Sennacherib, Rabshakeh, pictures of the Antichrist and the devil. And you have the fallen away inside the kingdom. Shebna was not very happy with the king. And he didn't share his righteousness. Hezekiah was a very faithful man, fallen like all of us. And you'll see some of his faults 
But one of the greatest things that Hezekiah would do, he admitted his faults, quickly repented, and he received grace from the Lord. Every time it happened, he, he was just like you and me. You know, Jacob was talking about the man in the mirror. I could so identify with that because I know the worst sinner in the whole world. You realize I know the worst sinner in the whole world? Who's the worst sinner you know? The one in the mirror. If you say it's your wife or your husband, then you're lying, right? <laughs> I tell my wife, you know, one day, one day your husband's going to be perfect. One day. your husband, And she comes to the end of her face. She comes to the brink of falling away because she just can't believe God's word says that. And it's true. It's a joke. We make a joke about it all the time because she's going to be perfect too. And I can't believe it either. You know, so that's the, that, that's the reality of it. But the Bible says Hezekiah was a faithful man, humble man, but he was challenged. In many different ways, God's going to allow this. Uh, he allowed this challenge in Hezekiah's life. God will allow this challenge in your life. The devil's trying to take away your crown. There's enemies outside. There's enemies within. But Jesus' encouragement was, I'm coming quickly. Let no one take away your crown. Let's see how... Hezekiah dealt with that. By the way, if there's somebody, um, Blair, somebody there back there, can have any water? I'm running out of saliva very quickly. So, three challenges to Hezekiah's rule. Number one, pride. Pride is the most serious of all sins in some, in some way or another. It's the sin that generates other sin. Thank you. Where is your reward in heaven, brother? Great is your reward in heaven. Pride. He was a devout man, but he was challenged with these things about pride. We're told in the same chapter, look at chapter 22. I'll say same book, sorry. Chapter 22, verse 12. This is what happened to Shebna, and this is what would challenge all of us. Pride. It says in chapter 22 of Isaiah, verse 12, Therefore, in the day of the Lord, in the day the Lord God hosts called the weeping and wailing, the shaving of the head into wearing sackcloth. Instead, there's gaiety, there's gladness, there's killing of cattle, slaughtering of sheep, eating the meat and drinking the wine. Let us drink, for tomorrow you may die. For the Lord of hosts revealed himself to me. Surely this iniquity shall not be forgiven us until you die, says the Lord God of hosts. And then he begins to talk about Shebna. See, God has called them to repent, to weep, to wail, to sackcloth. Why? Judah was under judgment. God was bringing the Assyrians. Israel had just fallen. The kingdom of Israel just fell. Lachish had just fallen. In Assyria, there was no stopping them. They were coming right to Judah. And God says, you need to repent. You need to wail. You need to weep. And what were they doing? It's all good, man. They just have a huge festival, a huge party, a huge concert. Everybody just drink and be merry because who cares? Tomorrow we may die. And instead of preparing the people, as God said, you need to be fortifying the cities. You need to be ready. There's a battle coming up ahead. Shebna was going, I'm just storing up treasures for myself. Uh, the, the story of Shebna comes into play here, that he wanted to build this tomb, this elaborate tomb, Chariots and God says, I'm going to kick you out of the kingdom because you're not being faithful to what you were called to do. You were the one that had the household of David. You were the one that was supposed to let people in and you were supposed to shut the door and open, but you're not being faithful. It's going to be given to Eliakim. Pride. Pride got in the way because Shebna was all about himself, the chief of staff. But you know what? The same thing got into Hezekiah, turn to 2 Chronicles very quickly. 2 Chronicles chapter 32. 2 Chronicles 32. Just to read a little bit about it, we have to read it in a synoptic account, but the word synoptic just means side by side, to view it side by side. Optic, synoptic, sin, side, optic, view. Look at it side by side. Look at all the three accounts of Hezekiah in the light of each other. 2 Chronicles 32. Look at verse 23. 2 Chronicles 32. Verse 23, and many were bringing gifts to the Lord at Jerusalem and cho uh, choice presents to Hezekiah, king of Judah, that he was exalted in the sight of all the nations thereafter. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill and he prayed to the Lord and the Lord spoke to him and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah gave no return for the benefit he received because his heart was proud. Therefore, wrath came upon him on Judah 
and on Jerusalem. He was lifted up. He was like Shebna. Pride got in the way. But look at verse 26. However, Hezekiah humbled himself in the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come on them in the days of Hezekiah. Pride. Pride. He repented of it. Quickly came in his heart. Quickly left. The hand of the Lord was upon him, upon him. But the first challenge for every Christian is going to be pride. Satan is proud. And one of the ways he's going to try to take away our crown is through pride. To be proud even what you have done. To be proud of the things that God has done in your life. Now, there's no, there's no problem sharing your testament. There's no problem talking about the Lord and the things God's done in your life. But when it becomes so over the top that it becomes now things you have accomplished, begin to see that the devil has laid a trap for us to begin to take away our crown. If you start thinking like that, the devil starts to get a hold of us and we start being lifted up. Oh, but there's a lot of pride in ministries. Oh, there's a lot of pride in ministries, especially in the back room. You see a lot of that. A lot of that. You know, pastors who are not able to, nobody can ask him a question. You ask him a question. You're an insolent man. I can't believe you're questioning me. It happens a lot in ministry and such rivalry, such pride. God sees it. God sees it. There's like Shebna. Oh, but there's Hezekiah. He wasn't a strong man, the Bible says. You have little strength. Go back to Isaiah. Go back to Isaiah and look at chapter 37. You have little strength. By the way, if you ever wanted to, if your friends ever challenge you, is Hezekiah and Isaiah really a real people? Well, let me, there's a, there's a screen back here, and it has the bulas, basically like a signet, like a, like a um, what would you call it, like little bulas. It's a seal, right? Yeah. And uh, they have found them. They found them in Jerusalem, near the Temple Mount. This is the bula that they found just recently of Hezekiah. And it, and it reads, exactly as the Bible says, belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. They also found one nearby. Belongs to Isaiah. Some guy Isaiah, and he was a prophet. And they were both found right next to each other in the same area. And uh, there's no doubt about the authenticity of these signets, of these rings, of these uh, uh, emblems, that they were real people at a time they existed together. And boy, the Bible says the same thing, isn't it? Because the life of Hezekiah, it's also in the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah went to talk to Hezekiah. Hezekiah talked to Isaiah at a very, very difficult time. Isaiah chapter 37. Look at verse uh, verse 1, when the king Hezekiah heard about the Assyrian coming in and the threats of the Assyrians, he heard and he tore his clothes, he covered himself with sackcloth, just like the Lord had told him to do earlier, in the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household of Shebna, household with Shebna, the scribe, and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth to the prophet Isaiah, to the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos. And he said to him, thus says Hezekiah, this is a day of distress. The Syrians are right outside. They're ready to invade us. We have no way to defend ourselves. They're so huge, and we're such a small kingdom. We're such a small uh, remnant. This is a day of distress, rebuke, and rejection, for the children have come to birth, and there's no strength to deliver. There's no strength left in us. Assyria is just going to ran over us. Perhaps the Lord your God hears the words of Rabshakeh, which his master of the king of Syria sent to the reproach. He's a reproach to the living God. He was being a reproach to God. He was speaking evil things of God. Hezekiah was not strong. Hezekiah had little strength. But how did he overcome? How did he overcome? How did he overcome pride? He refused it. He refused it. He refused pride and took on humility. Jesus is exactly that. Just like Eliakim, there was a humility about his reign, his kingdom. Pride will destroy all of us. He refused it. And that's going to be our first attack. It's going to come from the devil to come to take away our crown. Is going to be pride. And pride is a horrible thing, especially in ministry. Refuse it. Grab a hold of humility. Put it on like a cloak. Put on Jesus, the Bible says. And that is humility. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's the humility, to serve one another. Not, no job is too small. 
nothing is beneath us to serve the body of Christ. Pride will destroy all of us. And it nearly destroyed Hezekiah, but God had mercy, and he repented of it. He wasn't strong. He had little strength, just like the church of Philadelphia. Turn to chapter 39 of Isaiah, very quickly. Chapter 39. At that time, Merodach Baladan, son of Baladan, the king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he had been sick, and he recovered, and Hezekiah was pleased, and showed them all his treasures of his house, silver, gold, and spices, and precious oil, and his whole uh, armory, and all that was found in his treasuries. And there was nothing in his house, nor all of his dominion, that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say? From where do they come from? And Hezekiah said, they've come to me from a faraway country, from Babylon. Which, by the way, that's a key word. It's bad. Really, really bad. Anything comes from Babylon, don't go to it. Don't go there. Don't grab a hold of it. Stay away from it. Hezekiah should have known. And he said, what have they seen in your house? Hezekiah answered, they've seen all of them to my house. There's nothing among my treasuries. I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all of this house and all of your fathers have laid up in store for this day will be carried away to Babylon. <coughs> Speaking of the future. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your sons who will, issue, uh, who will issue from you, or whom you will beget, shall be taken away, and they shall come officials in the palace of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good, for he thought, for there will be peace and truth in my days. Hezekiah pleaded before the Lord. He'd done something. He'd done something that he had not to have done. He showed all the treasures to Babylon. And Babylon, of course, picture of false religion. The religious system of the last days will be Babylonian. Very much all false religions today have roots in Babylon. And here comes Babylon, waltzing in, and he compromises. And compromise is going to be one of the big things that's going to come in our day. Compromise with false religious system. Compromise with religious systems that are not compatible with Scripture, that are not in from the New Testament. These are the things that are going to challenge us. Pride, and here comes compromise. And of course, how did he maintain his crown? Well, the Bible says he listened, he repented, and he accepted God's grace, and he says, yes, this is done, but there will be peace and truth in my days. It's not going to come in his day. God had mercy on him. It wasn't going to come in his days. It would come later. And of course, his son was Manasseh. Manasseh began a total decline from that point on, even though they had good revivals after that with Josiah, but then eventually Babylon came. But this is prophesied here that Hezekiah opened up the treasures. And this is the compromise we see in the church, compromise with isms, whether it's Catholicism, whether it's Mohammedism, whatever it may be, it is compromise. And God says, don't throw the treasures to Babylon. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, Paul says. It's, it's the gospel. It's the spirit in us. It's the truth in us. And that cannot be compromised with any false god or any false religious system. Yet Hezekiah compromised. And it says that this caused a judgment to come upon the nation of Israel, the kingdom of Judah, and they will be carried after Babylon. Well, there's many things getting back to Babylon. Revelation tells us they'd all go back to Babylon. All the False religious system will be, as we talked about yesterday, Babylon the Great, the horror of Babylon, will come on the scene. And of course, this is God's intervention here. He says to Hezekiah, it won't happen in your day. There'll be truth for my days. For right now, there'll be truth, Hezekiah, but it's not going to come. It's going to come later. Unfortunately, Babylon comes and we show off. And this is, again, part of the pride. We show off. We show off and we compromise. And this is going to be a challenge to all of us. It's going to be a challenge to the church, challenge to all of us about showing off the treasures of the Lord and compromising with false religious systems. Showing off your treasures. By the way, personally, as a personal application, I was reminded of this, about the showing off, especially with Babylon, the this, this spirit of Antichrist that exists in the world, drawing people away from Jesus. Remember, the spirit of Antichrist is to replace Jesus in your heart. The Antichrist is not here yet, the Bible says, but the Bible says you heard he was coming, yet many Antichrists are already in the world, John says. In a sense, Antichrist, the beast, not here yet, but the spirit of Antichrist is, and many Antichrists are already in the world. This is at the time of John. Can you imagine now? Right? 
there are many antichrists. And the Bible says that this is a compromise that's going to come to replace Jesus in the hearts of Christians. That's the spirit of antichrist, to remove Jesus out of the spot that he holds in your heart. You know, the number one spot, the one out of one, that, that Jesus is special, that Jesus is real, that Jesus is true, that he's the only one, he's the only begotten of the Father. He is the only true and living God, the one that holds that spot in your heart. Antichrist comes and he wants to remove it, he wants to knock Jesus off your heart. And it's so easily done, right? Because we can compromise with so many things. We can compromise with sin. And this is, again, against the Babylonian things, the Babylonian systems. How many times you see Christians fall into sin because of just not guarding their treasures, right? Young ladies, young men, guard your treasure, your body. The God, the God who created you gave you your body. It belongs to him. Don't show off your treasures to Babylon. Don't go on compromising with sin flirtations and giving away what belongs to God, first of all, and what could be for your husband or for your wife later in marriage. Don't show off your treasures. It belongs to God. He gave you that purity. He gave you that, uh, um, the body to be used in a godly way. But let's continue. That's for another time, for another place. Number three. So pride, compromise, but the lies of the enemy. Go back to chapter 36 again. The lies of the enemy. Sennacherib sends Rabshakeh, a picture of the Antichrist, speaks for the devil. He comes and he challenges God's people. Look at verse 16. Don't listen to Hezekiah. Thus says the king of Assyria, Isaiah 36, verse 16. Make peace with me and come out with me. Each one will have his own vine of its fig tree and drink each one of his own water cisterns until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Compromise. Remember, the devil's trying to take away your crown. The devil's trying to take away Hezekiah's crown. Compromise. Rav Shekah says, there's, of course, these are lies. Lies of the enemy. Just compromise with us. It's much better on the other side. I will just take you to another land and you'll have vineyards. You have plenty of bread. You have plenty of water. You can have a nice life. Just come with us. Who can resist us? We're the Assyrians, by the way. And this is the world, and this is the lies of the enemy, that there's life outside of Christ. That there's life outside of Christ. My friend, there's no life outside of Christ. What life is there outside of Christ? I lived 20-some years outside of Christ. Never want to go back. Never want to go back to Babylon. Lived in Babylon, believed in Babylon. Babylon has nothing good, but then it calls you, doesn't it? Oh, just come out. It's okay. You can have a very nice life in this world. All the riches of this world belong to us anyway. The Assyrians, no one can get in their way. He was the king of the world, you would say, Sennacherib. The temptation to allure us into thinking a life outside of Christ. You know what? Politically, economically, Sennacherib and Rabshakeh were right. They did hold all the rule of the world, all the riches of the world. It was theirs. There was no denying that. Just like Satan came to Jesus and he said, I can give them to whoever I want. The kingdoms of the world, I can give them to whoever I want. Just bow down, they'll be yours. And Jesus says, depart from me. Satan, get thee hence, right? Jesus understood it wasn't about this life. My kingdom is not of this world. Your kingdom, your inheritance, your reward, your crown is not going to be coming from the world. It's not going to come from the, it's not going to come from politicians. They're not going to come from social leaders. They're not going to come from this world. It's not even going to come from the church. It's going to come from Jesus. And Jesus understood that the only way through was the, the cross, the cross of Jesus. What's life outside of Christ? Nothing. But the cross of Jesus is how we're saved. It's the cross that we need to grab a hold of. Don't let anyone take away your crown. Grab a hold of the cross. That's how you avoid it. Number two, look at verse 18. Beware, Rabshakeh is still speaking, Hezekiah is going to mislead you. The Lord will deliver you, saying that the Lord is going to deliver you. Has any of the gods of the nations deliver the land from the hand of the king of Assyrians? Where are the gods of Hamath, Arpad? Where are the gods of Seraphim? Where have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of the land delivered the, uh, 
Have they delivered their land from my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? You know, he's challenging the very protection of God over his people. Come and join us. It's, it's futile to resist. It's all going to be part of this system anyway. If you want the best things in life, join the world. If you want to have the best house, best riches, the best schools, the best education, the best job, the best house, the best neighborhood, join the world. And they would say, but we own everything. Look, nobody's going to stop us. Who's going to stop us? We're all going to come together. We're all going to have a nice system, a unified system monetarily. Everything is going to be one. Everything's going to be great. Just join us. What's your problem? You think God's going to deliver you? That was the threat. That was the lies of Rav Shekha to the kingdom of Judah, to the remnant of Judah. Do you really think the Lord's going to deliver you? Do you really think this is going to happen? And the world looks so enticing because you look at it and you go, yeah, they're right. They do have all the economies. They do have all the power. They do have all the system. Except that the Bible says it was God who allowed them to have it. It was God who allowed them to have it. Look at chapter 37, verse 26. This is God's response to Isaiah. Chapter 37, verse 26 of Isaiah. Have you not heard long ago? I did it. From ancient times, I planned it, says the Lord. Now I brought it to pass that you should turn four to five cities into ruinous heaps. I'm the one, Sennacherib, who allowed you to have those victories. But you have now spoken against the Holy One. And it's enough is enough. See, the world thinks that it's, this is all we have. This is great. We have all the systems of the world. Who's allowing it? God. God is allowing them to have these things, temporal things in this world. The world's in the power of the wicked one. Satan's in control of it. Just like Sennacherib, he was in control of it. He can give them to whoever he wants. Number three, the lies. Chapter 36 again, verse 7. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord your God. Is it not he who high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall not worship before this altar? Rabshakeh was saying, you know, Hezekiah hasn't been really that kind to you. Um, he took away all your altars, all your places of worship. Remember, Hezekiah came in and Ahaz, his father, had done all everything opposite. Worship in high places, brought all these other idols and worship in different places. Instead of the one place, Jerusalem, Hezekiah tore it all down and says, no, you shall worship the Lord in Jerusalem the way he prescribed them in the law of Moses. And Rav Shekha turns it around and says, you know what? He's just being mean to you. He kept you from all these idols. You really don't have the true faith. You really don't not worshiping God. Because remember, Rav Shekha in his mind is more idols, more places of worship, the better it is. <laughs> more gods. It's an idolatrous uh, society, right? In his mindset. But God says, no, worship the Lord thy God, only one God in one place in Jerusalem, the Old Testament. And the Bible says that he challenged that they really, if they really had real faith, you know, the challenge comes to us as Christians in the same manner. You know, the world looks at the church today, the remnant church, the faithful ones, the Philadelphia ones, you guys, people in different places in different countries when we meet. And one of the things we hear all the time is the the other church is challenging the remnant believers and saying, you guys don't have real Christianity. Look at this. You guys are meeting in a, what is this, hall? You guys aren't even in a church. Come on. You guys don't have a priest. You guys don't have pastors with the, uh, you know, degrees from our institutions. You guys don't have, a, uh, you know, the, the smoke machines and you guys don't have a steeple. You guys meet in a house. What? Really? Oh, you know, that's not real faith. That's not real Christianity, says the world. You guys need to join us. Look, we got the numbers. We got the thing. We got the building. We got the pastors. We got the seminaries. We got all these things. Come on. No. You're not a registered church. That's going to be a big part in the last days, just like in persecuted countries. You're not a registered church. What are you? We have the Bible. We have the Holy Spirit. And we have each other. We are the ones who worship God in spirit. We don't worship God in the flesh. And see, that's the difference. They had the true worship because they had the true word of God. They had the true prophet of God and they had the true king of Judah. But Rabshakeh was challenging them. They were saying, no, you don't have that. 
You don't have the true one. You don't have real Christianity. You don't have real faith in God. Look at that. You didn't even, you didn't have the building yet. You're just meeting here on a Saturday and on a Sunday and at a home. But the Bible says those were lies. And even Hezekiah says in verse 21, he told them, don't answer a word to them. Don't answer a word to them, said Hezekiah. Don't answer him. And see why? Because God knows. Is that the five plus the ones you took? No? Okay, I'm just kidding. I'm just going to wrap it up. Sennacherib did not destroy Jerusalem, by the way. At the end, just kind of summarize it. There's a lot more. We can skip around. I'll leave it up to your own liking to go through the passages of Hezekiah. Sennacherib did not destroy Jerusalem. In fact, the Bible says, I'm going to turn him back. And he did. He turned him back. And later on, the Bible says he was killed by even his own sons. God destroyed Sennacherib. And he didn't even shoot an arrow into Jerusalem. And it's true. In fact, we, there's been uh, artifacts found in Nineveh, the area of Nineveh, where they have the story of Sennacherib. You know what it says? It says, uh, Sennacherib says, yep, I had uh, Hezekiah trapped like a bird. That's all it says. He doesn't say anything else about him. It's almost like silent. He conquered all the cities, all the, all the conquest, all the conquest of uh, Sennacherib are all recorded, except that one. He just says, I had Hezekiah like a bird trapped. That's all it says. Never wrote about him. Why? Because he went home with his tail between his legs, heading home, and he was killed, destroyed. And that's what's going to happen to the false systems of the world, the false religion systems of the world. Go back to Revelation. Let's finish off. Hold fast and let no one take your crown. Revelation chapter 3. I have not been faithful to thee. But I will now. Revelation chapter 3, let's finish off. Verse 11. I am coming quickly. Hold fast. Let no one take your crown. Now you know. You can go back to the kings and look at the faithful kings, especially Hezekiah, and see the challenge of the devil in the world, in the compromise, in the lies, in the pride, coming into them, and what are they going to do? Clothe yourself with humility. Don't give in to compromise. Don't listen to the words the lies of the enemy, the trust in the living word, trust in the word of God. God promised those things and he makes a promise to them. Say, he who overcomes, did Hezekiah overcame? Yes, he did. He overcame because he humbled himself. Even when he was sick, we didn't talk about that part, left it off for another time. Even when he was sick, mortally wounded, God gave him 15 more years. God gave him 15 more years and they came to him to find out, what did God do to you? <laughs> How did he heal you? God gave him time, and, and all the uh, what, what Hezekiah accomplished are written in Chronicles. God gave him fa favor during his time. Now, after him was Manasseh, and after Philadelphia is Laodicea, so they're on the same boat. Something wicked comes along later. The promise is, let no one take away your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He will not go out from it anymore, the pillars. By the way, there's pillars that they found in the city of uh, Philadelphia today. Pillars, kind of an interesting thing that that's all remains. Very little remains of the, what Philadelphia was. But there's pillars in the temple of my God. Four times, my God, my God, my God. Promises these things. The name of my God will be written. The city of my God will be written. And the new name, the name of Jesus, will be written upon us. They'll be like the pillars, two pillars in the temple of Solomon. One was Boaz, one was Jachin. And the strength he will establish. That's what the name means. Two pillars. You be like pillars that will not go out anymore. You won't backslide anymore. You will overcome. If you're faithful to me, you will overcome. You won't backslide. The promises. The name of my God. You are children of God. Beloved, it has not been revealed what we should be like, but we know when he appeared, we'll be like him. What a privilege to be called the children of God. I don't know how that grab a hold of you today. But Jesus calls you the children of God. My God. You notice four times, my God, Jesus reminding us. This is God too. <laughs> my God, my God, my God. You belong to God. I don't know what ambition you have in this world, but if you're children of God today, you have reached the highest of any capacity any human being can have in this world to be a children of God. And yet you see Christians' ambition for this world. They want to have this. They want to have that. They want to give a hold of this. They want to have a bigger church and this and that. Look, if God gives a bigger church, praise the Lord for him. Make sure that they're saved and discipled. 
but there's nothing higher than you could ever be come in this world than the children of God. And yet there's eternity ahead. We've only just begun, to quote from Paul. The name of the city of my God, you're going to have a new citizenship, the new Jerusalem who comes out of heaven, a new passport. I've had two passports all my life. I was born in Nicaragua, and I've had a passport. And I was, and then I became an American citizen. I have a passport. That's how I came here. But all those two fail, and they pale in comparison to the passport, the citizenship that you and I share in Jesus. The citizenship is in heaven, and Babylon wants to give you one. This world, Jesus wants to give you the one that is eternal. It's the city of God, the one Abraham left everything for. He left heating. He left the most wonderful place to live in at the time. Yes, they did have heating and toilets in the Ur of Chaldeans at the time of Abraham. He left all of that, and he went toward a city whose builder and maker is God. He looked at it from afar. He didn't receive it. They said the promises of God, did not, he did not receive them. He died in faith. Wouldn't that be wonderful for us to have be, been told about us? They died in faith. Not they used to believe. Not they once had faith. It's they died in faith. The Bible says, Hebrews 11, they all died in faith, which is a wonderful thing. Not having the promises yet. Why? Because God wanted us to share it with them. It really grabs a hold of me, that verse. That God did not give it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Elijah, and Moses. He did not give them the promises because he was waiting for you to share it with them. Amazing thing. Hebrews 11. i got to go on because i got to finish. The special promise is to have the new name of Jesus. That name which is above every name, Paul says, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. But he's going to give us an increase. And I'll leave you with this. I'm not going to play the video. We'll play it for another time. He's going to give us an increase. I have said before you an open door, God says. Look for open doors that God has given you, faithful people here in Vancouver and Richmond. Look for open doors. What door is the Lord opening for us to increase? Is it in the prisons? Is it in a group that we've never talked, never thought about going out and reaching out to them and sharing with them what God has done in us and for us and through us and what Jesus did on the cross? Look for those open doors. God wants to give us open doors as small and as remnant as we can be. A small group of Philadelphia, God says, I'm going to give you an increase, an open door, and even your enemies are going to come, which is a promise to Israel in the Old Testament. It's a promise to the believers in the New Testament. Even the enemies will come and bow down and says, yes. You're loved by the Lord. They will acknowledge. Plus, he's going to give you immunity. All these things, paresmo, trouble is coming in the world, a time of testing. I will keep you through that time of testing. God is testing. God is going to test those who dwell on the earth. Just like in the Old Testament and Exodus, God gave nine tests to Egypt, one plague after another, nine tests, and then the last one, the judgment. But the firstborn was killed. Nine tests. God is sending tests to this world. And Jesus says, I will keep you through these tests. I will keep you from them. This is a paresmo. This is a test that's coming. And over and over again, the Bible says they won't repent. They won't repent. People won't repent. But yet God wants to give us immunity from this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to you and to me. This is for me. This is for you. The Old Testament is for me and is for you. Read it, believe it, trust in it, live your life on it, build on it. Let no one take away your crown. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, your son, we thank you, Lord, that your reward is with you. And you're bringing it back to give according to what we've done. Lord, we ask you for your favor today. Lord, forgive us for our pride. Forgive us for our apathy. Forgive us, Lord God, for our compromise and being conformed to this world and give us lord the victory and give us lord god the grace to overcome let no one take away our crown lord thank you for those exhortation that promise that if we overcome we will have your name on us lord while the world will wait for the antichrist to come and have their mark have his mark on them lord we have your mark on us in Jesus. Amen. Thank you for letting me share. God bless you guys.